going to no doubt uh, an inspiring and an enriching 90 minutes of your life. This is the Celebrating Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage in the Classroom webinar. Uh, it is brought to you by the Asian American Pacific Islander Coalition of Wisconsin and PBS Wisconsin Education. Again, we are so happy you're here, and this is going to be a really, really great thought-provoking time for everyone. Uh, why are we here today? Well, hopefully you already have some idea of why you're here since you signed up for this, um, but just to uh, make it exceptionally clear, uh, we are here today to build teacher background knowledge around uh, APIDA, uh, Asian Pacific Islander Desi American Heritage, in the context of the Wisconsin Association of School Boards Resolution and get educators feeling excited and empowered, regardless of your grade level or your content area, to teach and incorporate more about this important topic. And if you hear me talk about the Wisconsin Association of School Board Resolution, and you're not quite sure what I'm talking about, stick around, that will be explained to you soon. Uh, a little bit more broadly, uh, we're also here today to understand the value of diversity and the contribution of APITA and the contributions that APITA people have made both nationally and right here in uh, Wisconsin. Um, again, we are so happy that you're here uh, to make sure that we can uh, uh, manage these objectives together as a group uh, and that everyone feels safe and productive. There are going to be community guidelines that you can check out in the chat box just to make sure that we're all operating from the same place uh, and we get the most out of this as possible. All right, so let's dig in a little bit. You're here to learn, you're here to build your background knowledge uh, around Asian American culture, history, contributions, et cetera. Uh, but to start, uh, we're curious. We wanna know where you currently get most of your perceptions and knowledge of Asian Americans. So we're gonna have you do uh, a little poll um, there's some directions here on the, on the slide, but I'm also going to read them out loud to make sure that everyone gets where they need to go. So first thing that you're going to do to take the poll is you're going to go to pollev.com backslash PBS Wisconsin 486. Uh, and you can see right up at the top of our slide that uh, that web address is listed. But again, you're going to go to poll, P-O-L-L-E-V.com backslash PBS Wisconsin 486 to, uh, to take the poll. Uh, the link will be in the chat too. You can click on that link as a quick, easy way to get there. And then when you get to the poll, you're gonna see that there are six choices and you're gonna rank those six choices. Again, where you mostly get your perceptions and knowledge of Asians, Amer Asian Americans from. Uh, you're gonna see that you can rank them uh, using up and down arrows, which are located on the left side of each item. You'll put your number one choice at the top of that list and then chronologically rank two, three, four, five, six, with number six being at the bottom. And when you're done, you're going to hit submit to send us your answer. Uh, we're very, very anxious to see where everyone gets their uh, knowledge from. And uh, of course, if you're here today, you're going to be getting even more knowledge. So I'm going to give you just a few more seconds to fill that out. We got family, friends, TV, music, or movies, social media, news, colleagues. There might even be other places where uh, you get your perceptions and your knowledge from. If you want to type those, those places in the chat, please go for it. We would love to hear more. Uh, these are just six. There's probably endless places. So if you have others, feel free to put them in the chat. But let's take a look. Okay, these are our results right now. There are still some results coming in. You can see the bars moving a bit. Uh, looks like friends and family lead the way, social media in third, followed by news, TV, music, or movies, and colleagues in sixth place. Well, wherever you get your knowledge and perception of Asian Americans from, uh, we are pretty sure that you can add today's webinar and all of the collected resources that we're going to share with you to this list. These are reliable resources that we're going to share, and we are really, really excited to hopefully make you a resource for the, those, fr those friends, those family members, and those colleagues that you just listed. Uh, kind of pay it forward, if you will. Uh, this is an opportune time for me to introduce myself. I've done a fair bit of talking, so you might want to know who I am. 
Uh, my name is Michael Hartwell. I am a third through 12th grade education engagement specialist with PBS Wisconsin Education. A lot of people know about PBS because of the, the popular programming, the streaming. Uh, when you were a child, maybe you watched Sesame Street. Maybe as an adult, you still do. That's cool. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big Elmo fan still. Um, but in addition to all of those great programs, we also have a statewide education agency that makes uh, classroom materials specific for uh, education students and educators. We also offer uh, professional development sessions. And uh, when our webinar is wrapping up, we're going to give you some opportunities to get in touch with us if you feel so interested. But uh, in addition to uh, what PBS has done, we have been so, so lucky to partner with the AAPI Coalition of uh, Wisconsin. And uh, I'm going to pass that off uh, for an introduction from Jessica. Jessica, uh, tell us a little bit more about the AAPI Coalition of Wisconsin, if you don't mind. Jessica might be having some technical difficulties. I'm sorry, I've done this so many times. Why? Whatever. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Jessica Bowling. I'm the co chair of the AAPI Coalition of Wisconsin. Uh, we were formed in the spring of 2020 in response to the rise of anti Asian hate um, in response to the pandemic. Uh, we are a coalition of about 20 organizations across the state. Uh, this is actually a unique uh, situation for us because AAPIs had not really been um, organized across the state and under one umbrella. Um, and so while this um, the rise of anti-Asian hate was a tragedy. It also created a unique opportunity for us to come together and um, advocate on behalf of AAPIs in the state of Wisconsin. Um, we, uh, right now, we support legislation and issues that affect the AAPI communities. Um, we work with um, AAPI civic engagement and the political process and educating people on how to um, become more active and empowered uh, in their voice. Um, and we advocate for AAPI educational curriculum. Uh, so you might be asking, why is um, May AAPI Heritage Month? Um, so May um, denotes several uh, events that happened in AAPI history. Um, the two that come to, to the top are the immigration of the first Japanese people to the United States in um, May 7th of 1843. And then the finalization of the Transcontinental Ra Railroad was accomplished May 10th, 1869 by predominantly Chinese immigrants. Uh, next slide. Um, so thinking about um, AAPI Heritage Month and beyond, um, we encourage people to look at the numbers, understand uh, how we are as a population. Disaggregated data is also a huge um, uh, issue within our community because we are very diverse and we have the, um, different um, needs and we're not always seen uh, just as East Asian. There's a large uh, diversity within um, the umbrella AAPI. Learn about our history, uh, our challenges, and also our, co our contributions and our celebrations. Um, our model is, uh, create more understanding, create more appreciation, and eventually uh, that leads to more empathy and better understanding between communities. Uh, and next we'll learn more about educational um, resources from PBS. Great, thank you, Jessica. I am Jamie Hookstra Collins. And I am an early learning engagement specialist with PBS Wisconsin. And we are thrilled to be releasing our new AKA teacher blog starring Cabby Hong, Wisconsin Teacher of the Year 2022. And this is a resource that is a blog space. It's written by teachers and for teachers, and it honors the tremendous work that teachers do to ensure that all of their students thrive. This blog space includes short videos featuring Wisconsin educators who share their experiences and insights, as well as their strategies that best meet the needs of all of their students. And you will be hearing more from Cabby later in this webinar. There's a few resources that we wanna highlight for you nationally and then more locally in Wisconsin. The first one is a sweeping, beautiful documentary entitled Asian Americans. And it explores the ways that Asian Americans have shaped our nation's history. So it chronicles the contributions and challenges of Asian Americans, which are the fastest growing ethnic group in America. It also includes short thematic segments coordinated with the national learning standards and over 30 lesson plans. We have a few collections in Wisconsin that we'd like to showcase for you. 
The first is our Wisconsin Biographies collection. And this particular um, portion features Zhou Bijong. And Zhou Bijong grew up in Laos and <clears throat> left Laos during the Vietnam War to make a new home in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, where he became the first Hmong American elected to public office. And Zhou Bijong's journey is depicted in a traditional Hmong story cloth that's pictured here and animated in our collection. His daughter narrates his story and it includes more resources for teachers like standards aligned lesson plans, student readers with audio glossaries and maps, educator guides and questions. And again, standards aligned lessons plans are integrated into this collection. Our next collection, collection is called the Resound Songs of Wisconsin. And this particular um, feature is Ma Vu. She is also a Hmong American who grew up in Wausau, Wisconsin. All of her songs are written in Hmong and sung in Hmong and her voice is incredible. It features videos of her performing and she's gotten more than 11 million views on her YouTube channel. Interviews of Ma Vu and an especially poignant one with her father who accompanies her on the two string Hmong violin as well as her musical performances and again, similar to Wisconsin biographies, this resource includes educational guides, questions for discussion, and standards aligned lessons for you. So in summary, our resources are on our websites, PBS Wisconsin Education and PBS Learning Media, and these will all be emailed to you as webinar attendees. When you look up our AKA teacher, um, webinar blog, you'll see the resources listed here from PBS that are inclusive, representative, and focus on the identity of all of our students. And then we also have resources to share with you from MJ Wong Engel of the AAPI Coalition that are really focused on expanding your knowledge and activism to stop Asian hate. And we are so thankful you're here. And now I think we will hear from Lorna from the AAPI Coalition. Hello everyone. I'm Lorna Young and I am with the, uh, I'm a member of the OCA, which is Organization of Chinese Americans. And I'm also on the executive committee of the AAPI Coalition, as well as a co-chair of the AAPI Coalition's Education Committee. Um, together with two of our coalition's Education Committee members, MJ Wong Engel and E. Per Wong, we will describe the WASB resolution, characterize what is Asian and what is Asian American, and then reflect on the treatment and representation of Asians in the US. And this will be as a way to help us understand why an AAPI educational curriculum is important for Wisconsin. Next, please. Our mission is to have Wisconsin implement an educational curriculum that includes AAPI culture, history, and contributions. And we've actually pursued two pathways to do that since last year. The first pathway is what we call the legislative pathway. What, our, what we're seeking to do is to amend Act 31, which was a 1989 law that was done through the Wisconsin State Legislature. Now, back in 1989, the Act 31 stated that at all grade levels, an understanding of human relations, particularly with regard to American Indians, Black Americans, and Hispanics be included in Wisconsin's instructional program. However, Asian Americans were not included. So the amendment to the Act 31 seeks to redress this issue by, at, by adding Hmong Americans and AAPI or APIDA to the law. Now, although we've had some pretty good successes in 2021, uh, led by Francesca Hong, who is our first AAPI state legislature, um, in the, some of the wins were to get recognized for our heritage. But with that having been said, the actual bill for amending Act 31 is still held up in the Wisconsin Legislature's Education Committee. So next steps we're hoping in the next year will be to go to hearing and have it voted on. The second route is called the administrative route. 
And that's where we're working with WASB or the Wisconsin Association of School Boards to implement a educational curriculum resolution. We're very thankful to MPS in particular because they passed the original resolution back in September to encourage Wisconsin to develop that curriculum. And then what happens, it went forth to WASB's policy and resolution committee who approved that resolution to be voted on in January by the delegate assembly. Well, I'm so happy to say that with a little bit of, um, of suggestion and an encouragement by our AAPI education team, the WASB resolution was passed in January 29, uh, 2022 on the 19th with a 70% yes vote, which is really quite awesome. Now, that's an example of a bottom up kind of, of, um, of, of uh, pass, pass as, as well as the top down. And I think both of them are very important, both pathways. So um, the educators who supported the resolution across, across the state were very thankful to, especially those school board members who very eloquently advocated for the passage of the resolution at the WASB convention. So now that the WASB resolution has been passed, we are still as a coalition continuing to advocate for and to support Wisconsin's K through 12 teachers in implementing the AAPI educational curriculum. Next page, please. The next page shows the actual resolution. It's really quite short, but I'll read it. It says the WASB encourages Wisconsin public schools to develop an educational curriculum and professional training to teach the culture, history, and contributions of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders to the economic, cultural, and social development of Wisconsin and the US. Now this resolution also requests the state legislature to provide sufficient funding to develop an appropriate model curriculum and training package. Now, why this is important is that resolutions that are passed by the WASB Delegate Assembly become the policy that directs the WASB staff, including its legislative agenda. Next page, please. Now, we're hoping that this WASB resolution will help encourage our K through 12 educators to learn about and teach AAPI history, particularly since a majority of Wisconsin school districts said yes. Um, what we are uh, remembering is that this resolution is an educational response to the hate and harassment experienced by AAPIs, which increased with the COVID-19 pandemic. We seek to encourage our public schools across Wisconsin, regardless of where those schools are located, whether that be in urban, suburban, or rural areas. And we seek to benefit all students, regardless of whether one is living in an area that has very few AAPI families or where there is a large community of AAPI residents. And we see that this will benefit all students. For AAPIs, we seek to support the, their development of a positive self-identity and image. And for and together with the non-AAPI students, for all of them to learn how to navigate differences and collaborate with others, as these are essential skills for all walks of life. Next screen, please. Now let's talk about what is Asian. Well, first of all, there's the continent. The continent of Asia was defined um, as you know, a piece of geography. And that includes countries in East Asia, which include China and Japan, South Asia, Southeast Asia, West Asia, and the Middle East. And it also includes part of Russia that's known as Siberia. That blue area on the top is Siberia, and it's also referred to as North Asia. Um, so this map harkens back to a Eurocentric colonial period where all countries east of Europe were considered to be Oriental or Asian. But as you can see, Asian includes people from over 48 countries who are with 56 or more ethnic groups and speaking over 2,300 languages and dialects. Next screen, please. Now, um, the history of Asians in America is not only a history of key events, but it's also a history of migrations of the major ethnic groups from Asia. The migrations of Asians to North America began as early as the 1500s with Filipinos coming to America as part of the Spanish trading expedition. Now, most of the early immigrants in the 1800s and early 1900s first came as workers escaping major economic and political upheaval. Um, next, please. That includes Chinese in the 1800s who came uh, with the railroads and the gold rush. Next, please. Japanese, as well as the um, 
and East Indians, and also the Korean Amer Koreans who came. All of these came in first as workers to escape major economic and political upheaval due to colonialism in their home countries. They were typically brought into the US by businesses to work in agriculture and the railroads, often to replace workers and even slaves to do the work that others did not want to do. Moving on, uh, Michael, with the, with the clicks there. Uh, more recently, Southeast Asians have been refugees from war and political chaos, including those from Southeast Asia, such as those from Vietnam, Thailand, Cambodia, and Laos, and the Hmong uh, people who came actually from Laos, which was their home, due to the ongoing political chaos in Southeast Asia. In addition, Tibetans came in the 1990s, and also uh, more recently, we have immigrants and refugees from Burma or Myanmar who started coming in large numbers from 2008, also escaping from um, war and um, uh, as refugees. Now the arrival of any immigrant group, whether it's um, um, a major migration like these, or um, just people that you might know who've come in from other countries, is based on their experience as they settle in the US is a function of immigration policy and their status upon entering. Categories like refugees or workers, whether they be documented or undocumented, or professional quotas. Okay, next please. Now, coming up to now, bringing it up to 2020, about 24 million of the US population is AAPI, and that constitutes about 7%. And six Asian groups in the US account for 85% of the nation's Asian population. And that includes Chinese, Indian, Filipinos, Vietnamese, Korean, and Japanese. And the rest that comprise 15% are mostly from uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia. Next, please. But given that the Chinese, for instance, were the number one population in the US uh, of the 2020 census, what is interesting is that each Asian origin group is different state by state. So whereas, for instance, in California and Oregon and Washington, Chinese Americans were the number one Asian origin group, in Milwaukee, in Wisconsin, and in Minneapolis, it is Hmong who are number one. And Wisconsin's AAPI demographic profile, therefore, differs significantly from the rest of the US, with the Hmong being number one. Therefore, as we look at our history nationwide, that's very important, the big events that have brought people in and the things that have happened in our, in our communities. But for us in Wisconsin, our local AAPI heritage communities are really unique to Wisconsin and should be covered in our AAPI curriculum. Next page. So relative to Wisconsin, AAPI make up about 4% of our total population. And as you can see from the pie chart, Hmong are number one, followed by East Asian, Chinese are number three, and the other API groups, are, which are primarily from East Asia, Southeast Asia, and South Asia, comprise the other 39%. Now, what's interesting is that even though about 4% of our total population in Wisconsin is AAPI, there are some counties, especially Dane, all the way down to Waukesha that are over 4%. So Dane is about 8% AAPI and Waukesha is about 5% and so is Eau Claire. And if you look at it from the point of view of just numbers of people, you can see that Milwaukee is the largest with 55%, 55,000, excuse me, and Dane is about 43,000. So it's certainly a significant number of people throughout these counties that whose needs need to be addressed in terms of education. Next slide, please. Um, even more interesting is that when you look at the school districts by district, about 4% of, of the, the districts that have 4% or more of their student populations comprise about 10% or about 50 of our school districts. And some of them have already initiated AAPI related curriculum. But then if you look at just even the top 15 school districts, they have from 20% in Wausau to 9% in their, in their school districts being AAPI. So a very significant proportion of their student population are AAPI. And so the question is, how are their needs being met as well as the needs of their peers? One interesting other fact is that while Eau Claire is 10% AAPI, one of our colleagues in um, Eau Claire who runs a uh, uh, elementary school there 
said that 30% of her student population is AAPI and particularly Hmong. So very, very important to address these specific demographics in our state. And again, whether our school districts have large or small percentages of uh, AAPI or are in urban, rural, or suburban areas, AAPI related curriculum will enhance all of our students' understanding of their peers and their globalized world. And now I'd like to introduce MJ Wong, who will speak further about Asian Americans. Awesome, thank you so much, Lorna, for that overview of both the term Asian and everything that represents, and then also a portrait by numbers of both the US and Wisconsin. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the term Asian American, and then also move us towards defining the some of the issues that we face as an AAPI community. Um, so I'll first introduce myself. My name is MJ Wong Engel. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm very proud to be a co-chair with Lorna of the Education Committee of the AAPI Coalition of Wisconsin. Um, and I think, so first, I, I always think it's really important to uplift the radical uh, history of the term Asian American. Two graduate students at UC Berkeley, Emma G and Yuji Ichioka, are the first people who actually coined the term Asian American back in 1968. And they did this from a very intersectional lens. They did this in solidarity with other communities of color. They were very much inspired by the civil rights and social justice movements that include the Black Power Movement and also the American Indian Movement. And this term was purposefully broad. Um, as Lorna outlined, you know, Asian American encompasses a lot of different ethnicities and both Emma and Yuji coined this term to really build this pan-Asian umbrella to start building power as a larger community. Uh, this term also replaced the colonial term Oriental in federal laws in 2016, which is, you know, not really too far away, um, but we're of course glad to see that change. And just to remind you all, Asian American includes people who live in the US and trace their roots to um, countries in East Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, or the Pacific Islands. And it's also meant to be, again, inclusive of all ethnicities, but you can also see here a few different acronyms that are used locally in different ways in order to uplift other communities. So for example, APIDA is a term that you've actually heard during this webinar, and we use it in our work as the API Coalition of Wisconsin um, as well. And APIDA uplifts specifically South Asian Americans. Um, the D stands for DEDSI. I, I also want to uplift here AANHPI, which you'll see the White House use. And this acronym stands for Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander, which is doing this work of really uh, uplifting our Native Hawaiian community by making sure that they're named in this term. And so moving on to defining some of the issues that we face as an Asian American community is one, this tension between awareness and hyper visibility. So here on this slide, you can see a number of graphic headlines um, that describe different violent acts that have happened against Asian Americans. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we have witnessed a rise in violence against Asian Americans. Some of this has unfortunately happened very close to home in Wisconsin. You can see here some headlines um, related to the Hmong Center, Hmong American Center in Wausau being targeted with graffiti, um, a hate crime complaint in Stevens Point. Uh, in New York, there have also been a few instances of harassment um, with two elderly Asian women punched in the head and also an Asian man in critical condition after being stabbed. I also want to uplift um, the tragedy that happened over a year ago now in Atlanta um, at the Atlanta spa shootings where eight, eight people were dead, found dead, um, six were Asian women. And this was definitely done with an anti-Asian bias um, towards these East Asian women. 
and is something that our community um, continues to honor and mourn and to grieve. And so this is some of the most up-to-date data that we have in terms of anti-Asian hate incidents. Um, what, we're, what we see here is out of the almost 11,000 hate instances that were reported between March 2020 and December 2021, more than half, 63% were verbal harassment, around 16% were physical assault, 16% shunning or avoidance, and then 11.5% civil rights violations. And so here I talked a little bit about the tension between awareness and hypervisibility. And what I meant by that is on the one hand, it's really great to be you know, aware of these issues, um, aware of the Asian American community that's a part of your neighborhood or your community. And at the same time, there can be ways in which this leads to hypervisibility, um, hypervisibility as a vulnerability. And so bringing it much closer to home, um, I know we have an audience of educators. One example of hypervisibility in your classroom would be if you have one Asian American student in your classroom who feels very hyper visible as the only one in the room and potentially carrying a burden to represent the rest of their community um, just at, on their shoulders. But the flip side of hyper, vis hyper visibility is invisibility. So this is all happening at once where there's both vulnerability due to hyper visibility, but then also feeling like you're not even being seen at all. And here in this report, um, we see that 37% of white Americans are not aware of an increase in hate crimes and racism against Asian Americans over the past year. And 24% go beyond that and say that anti-Asian American racism isn't even a problem that needs to be addressed. Um, and connected to this issue of invisibility, 42% uh, said that they cannot name a prominent Asian American. Um, so this is what we mean when we say we feel invisible. And this invisibility is directly connected to issues of representation or lack thereof of representation. We have very low to no representation in our public discourse across Wisconsin. Um, in our state government, we only have one state lawmaker who identifies as Asian American. Um, Representative Francesca Hong, we love her and we wanna make sure we're getting more people to be with her in the, in the assembly chambers. Um, and this lack of representation is a major issue because it materially impacts our community. Without having someone at the table or multiple people at the table representing our community's interests and issues, we see a lack in a, in a gap in educational policy. This is exactly what the WASB resolution that Lorna outlined earlier seeks to address. Is this invisibility in our educational policy? Um, you can also see here the other ways that being invisible in, um, in government affects us, such as not having a voice in fair and representative maps, um, having limited funding and scope of federal and Wisconsin social services, um, and the list really goes on. So now it is my pleasure to introduce E. Her Vang, who is going to talk to us about API treatment and representation. Thank you, Lorna and MJ. Um, again, my name is E, my pronouns are she, hers, and um, I'm a proud managing director that gets to work with educators in Milwaukee Public Schools and also an AAPI coalition member. So today I'll be talking about AAPI treatment and representation. Um, next slide, starting with some images. So as you all saw from the thorough timeline Lorna shared previously around AAPI arrival in the US, these were some of the images that were floating around to further discriminate against Asian Americans. Laws were also passed that were rooted in AAPI discrimination, and I'm just gonna talk about a few. 
1854, there was the case of People v. Hall, the California Supreme Court ruled that an individual of Asian descent could not testify against a white person in court. In 1875, uh, the United States passed the first restrictive immigration law in history, the Page Act, which restricted the entry of Chinese women for immoral purposes and was rationalized as being a safeguard against the belief that these women were temptations of white men. Lastly, the last act I'm going to mention is the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. This prohibited the immigration of all Chinese individuals for 10 years. It was renewed twice in 1892 and 18, in 1902 with no terminal date. It finally ended in 1943 with World War II due to Pearl Harbor, but there were still restrictive quotas. There are more in history, unfortunately, but I'm just mentioning a few for the sake of our time today. Can go next. And so sowing seeds of division, the model minority myth being formed. During the Cold War, the Asian American, Asian Americans could declare opposition to communism in East Asia as a way to assert their loyalty to the US. This is how this model minority myth was formed, that Asian Americans are quiet, good workers, good students, respectful of their elders, to really rationalize social inclusion of Asian Americans. Journalists and sociologists weaponize these, this term and ideas to discipline Black and Latinx people. And some Asian Americans also were tokenized and believed that they were better. Um, Asians were then used as a pawn to draw attention away from racism against uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color groups and place blame on the, the individual. This term today still is dangerous because it really just overlooks the needs of some Asian communities as we spoke to before. There's um, a lot of Asian Americans coming from so many countries and so many representation, and there are disparities that exist between different Asian ethnic groups. So as you can see the graph on the right, oh, if you can go back, yep. Um, the Hmong community who we've mentioned before is the largest Asian American group here in Wisconsin has the largest poverty rates. Um, in addition, about 12,000 Asian Americans in Wisconsin, which is about 8% lack health insurance. And as a whole, about 28,000 Asian Americans, Wisconsin, which is 18% live in poverty. There's also educational and language proficiency disparities. So Southeast Asians also have lower rates of high school graduation and about 50% of Vietnamese and Chinese household do, are not fluent in English and 20% of Filipinos and Asian Indians are not fluent in English. In addition, 75% of Wisconsin, Asian American Pacific Islanders speak a language other than English at home. So this, this is why translation interpretation is so important in our institutions and this model minority myth really overlooks all of the disparities that exist even within the Asian community. You can go next. And so continuing with historical Asian stereotypes that still persist today. Um, the quote, Asians are taking our jobs and can't be trusted can allude to the Vincent Chin murder in Detroit in 1982. Vincent Chin, he was a, a Chinese American man who was beat to death by two white males who mistaken him as a Japanese worker, which at that time uh, was taking, not taking, but having a lot of job opportunities in the automotive industry and was seen as taking jobs. Um, in addition, the anti-Asian sediment, uh, which we saw during COVID is not something new because this is something that has been ha happening in history as well. Asian stereotypes also differ between men and women. And so Asian men um, are characterized as predatorial, weak, undesirable, which led to a lack of male leading roles in Hollywood. As for Asian women, uh, we are hyper-sexualized, uh, there is a fetish uh, around us being exotic and being seen as avail available. And there is a long history of military prostitution that really generates these negative stereotypes. Wanting to highlight again um, the Atlanta spa shootings and uh, quoting Dr. Russell Jun, a uh, professor at San Francisco State University and co-founder of Stop AAPI Hate, uh, the Atlanta shootings were sort of a worse fears realize. And, um, it really is a period of collective racial trauma because we can see ourselves and our family members in these women and we could feel them in addition to the Vincent, Vincent Chin murder. Next. In addition, um, again, 
to our Western Asian, uh, South Asian brothers and sisters as well. Post 9-11, they were targeted as Muslim and faced discrimination and violence. Our Sikh community was especially targeted due to their head wraps. And you can see there's a visual on the right as well, alluding to that. And then there's this forever foreigner um, mindset where Asian American doesn't really equal Asian in America. So even second and third generation Asian Americans like myself are frequently asked where they are from or told that are, uh, they speak English surprisingly well. And so there is this immigrant confusion as you see in the image. Asian Americans are three times more likely to be mistaking, uh, mistaken as being from another country than white Americans and 10 times more likely to be misperceived as non-native English speakers than white Americans. And so these microaggressions often unintentional, but can be harmful and create serious impact over time. Harm for language, as I mentioned before, that we usually hear, where are you really from? Or I can't pronounce your name. Can I call you Jenny? Um, I offer some asset-based language of instead of asking those questions or saying those statements, you can say, what ethnicity do you identify as? Or could you help me pronounce your name? It's important that I say it correctly. There are some instances where the implicit bias is real and we're all human, um, such as some of the statements below. And I would just say um, it's a opportunity to dialogue and educate yourselves and also apologize so that you could just be more aware and educated in how to use asset-based language around Asian Americans. And so lastly, I want to end my portion in a positive note that despite some of the historical discrimination that has happened and continues to happen, positive AAPI representation is happening as well. And so here are some positive AAPI representation across all sectors from superheroes, Disney, athletes, literature, and our very own local elected officials here in Wisconsin. So when I think about our future generations, especially my niece Peyton, I have to give her a shout out because she's a big PBIS Kids fan. Um, it's important to seek positive role models, share Asian successes and contributions and build a sense of hope and pride in our AAPI students. So I wanna thank you all for learning with us today and I'm actually gonna pass it to another positive AAPI role model in our community. All right, everybody, thank you so much. Um, my name is Cabby Hong, and I am the 2022 Wisconsin State Teacher of the Year. And it is just really my honor and my pleasure to really be here um, speaking to you today in a very pivotal time. Um, I teach high school English at Verona Area High School, and I teach uh, ninth grade English as well as AP Language and Composition. And my presentation today is really um, talking about the why why is it so critical and important for us to have visibility, especially in our school curriculum? So if I could have you close your eyes and envision three people for me, can you envision a CEO, an author, and an American hero? So a CEO, an author, and an American hero. Who do you envision? Do any of your choices look like me? And I don't mean literally me, but are any of your choices Asian American? Because if they're not, then you're in good company. Here are my three choices. Um, they are all male, if you notice, and none of them are Asian American. And so my story is really the story of so many Asian Americans in this country of a developing sense of identity and developing sense of pride. And the pandemic has really brought these issues to the forefront and really talked about the consequences of this invisibility. So as I reflect back um, to my own teaching practice, I've been teaching for 21 years and I wondered, was I contributing to this um, visibility myself? And I realized that our background and experiences really shape our teaching practice and who we are. This is a picture of me in kindergarten, and this is a picture of me at Happy Days Elementary School in Los Angeles, California, where I was born. And when this picture was taken, I really couldn't speak English. Um, like most 
immigrant kids. I spoke Korean because my parents spoke Korean. And like a lot of immigrants, my parents decided to move in order um, to chase their American dream. So they took us to Trenton, Missouri, population 6,500. Trenton is a small rural farming community. And growing up there, I was the only Asian American kid in my entire town. And like all kids, I do the best to try and fit in, but it's a little hard when you're the only Asian American kid and your first name is Cabby. Who I really wanted to be was this guy, Steve Garvey. Steve Garvey represented everything that I wasn't. He had an easy to pronounce first name. He had all American good looks and he had manageable hair. I didn't have any of those three things. And looking back, um, I wanted to be Steve for a very specific reason because I didn't like being Asian American. And it was really because I never saw anyone that looked like me in the books that I read in high school, in any of my English classes that I loved. Um, there were never heroes that resembled me or had my background. In the history lessons that um, I had in school, I never saw Asian Americans deep roots in this country represented or talked about unless we were talked about as the enemy. In all of the shows and TV shows and movies that I loved watching, I longed to have someone that looked like me represented. But unfortunately, if someone that looked like me did show up, they oftentimes were the racist, stereotypical sort of butt of all jokes. This is a picture of me um, at the graduating class of Trenton High School class, um, in 1990. And um, I was really trying to find my way as a person. And I eventually found that I wanted to be a teacher. And I was lucky enough to um, teach with Kathy Bellin, Dr. Kathy Bellin, amazing mentor at West Middle School. And West was very similar to the school that I, I went to. It was nearly all white. Um, it was affluent and my high school wasn't. And when I got my first job at West after student teaching there, I inherited a curriculum that looked very similar to the curriculum that I had at high school. Um, it was made up of um, literary writers that were from the canon and there were no authors of color represented. And sadly, that was something that I was comfortable with. And at the time, I did not advocate to have a, a much broader representation of writers, especially Asian American writers. So the question I had is, how can we leverage teacher leadership and voice to positively influence school culture and student outcomes? Well, one of the things we learned during the pandemic is that school culture in the world outside, there really are no walls that separate a school from the outside world. And when we think about student outcomes as teachers, I know the first thing that comes to mind is oftentimes summative assessments and test results and data. But what if, instead of thinking about these outcomes, what if we thought about these outcomes? We thought about pride and belonging, self-worth, empathy, and inclusion. There have been more than 10,000 actually, this, this slide is actually old, um, anti-Asian incidents that were imported since the pandemic began. And nationwide, the um, explosion of hate crimes has just been incredibly dramatic. For Asian American families, you know, the considerations of going back to the classroom revolve around COVID, but sometimes they revolve around the safety of their children and how safe they actually feel. I am lucky enough to be a club advisor for an amazing group. It's called TASA at Verona Area High School and it stands for the Asian Student Association. It's the kind of group that I wish I had when I was a teenager. It's made up a group of Asian and non-Asian American students. And we get together and we talk about food and we talk about Asian culture. And um, during the pandemic, while we were on virtual, I wanted to check in on my students and see how are they doing? And um, one of my students was telling me about how she was at a store and a man approached her and yelled at her to go back to where she came from. 
And my first thought was to my student who I obviously was wanting to make sure she felt valued and that she felt safe. But the other thing I kept thinking about was this man and why he would say something like this to a teenager. And the research done by Launch kind of provides some perspective in terms of why he would say something like this. Launch is a nonprofit organization that has conducted the first nationwide survey of attitudes that Americans have towards Asian Americans. They did it in 2020 and they have a, mo a more recent report that just came out actually. And in its report, they found that approximately 80% of Asian Americans say they don't feel respected and they feel discriminated against here in this country. This is a, a lot on this chart, but at the very top, they asked respondents, in general, Asian Americans as a group are more loyal to their country of origin than to the United States. And they asked people, do you agree with this statement or do you not agree with it? And the numbers on the very bottom in white represent the results from 2020. And the numbers in yellow represent the recently released report from 2022. And sadly, their numbers are actually trending in the wrong direction. You know, almost a third, actually a third of Americans either completely agree or agree with this statement. And the reason why this is such an important um, slide is because of our own nation's history. We have a history of locking up Asian Americans who couldn't be um, loyal to this country because of how we looked. They asked Americans, where do you get your information? Which kind of goes back to our um, initial poll at the start of this webinar. And no big surprise, most people get their information from TV, music, and movies. Um, and sadly, school ranks very low. But the problem with TV, music, and movies is that they often peddle in stereotypes. And if that is your number one source of information about a group, um, how accurate will that be representation be? Um, this was mentioned earlier, but you know, they asked people, can you name an Asian American? And back in 2020, that number was 42%. And sadly, the most recent figure shows that 58% of people in the US can't name one famous Asian American. Um, the number one answer was, I don't know. The number two and three answers were Jackie Chan and Bruce Lee. And Bruce Lee died nearly 50 years ago and Jackie Chan isn't even an American citizen. What's remarkable is that when you look at this slide of incredibly accomplished Asian Americans, I know that there's a familiar face here. And I know that when you look at this slide, and you look at these faces, I know that there are familiar faces amongst this slide. But what's interesting is that when they're asked to just recall and to name a famous Asian American, a name escapes most um, Americans surveyed. So the question is, what can educators do to change this? Well, I believe that as educators, we are very good at taking the invisible and making it visible. We're also very good at taking a one-dimensional concept and making it three-dimensional. And we're also good at taking stereotypes and making them fully human. My goal as the 2022 Wisconsin State Teacher of the Year is to normalize humanity and excellence across all identities, not just one. This was not planned, but one of the best things I saw during the pandemic was PBS series, Asian Americans. And I was both elated and also angry at the same time. I was elated at all the things that I learned about the deep roots that Asian Americans have in our country. But I was also angered that I learned some of this as a 49 year old man. For example, I learned about the 442nd Combat Regiment. It was made up entirely of Japanese Americans who had families in internment camps. Yet when their country asked them, they bravely fought in Europe. And in fact, they are the most decorated unit in the history of US military service. And they were the most decorated because they're often given the most dangerous jobs. I learned about this incredible groundbreaking stateswoman 
Patsy Mink is the first woman of color elected to the US House of Representatives in 1964. And she worked on groundbreaking gender discrimination legislation, Title IX. I knew about Cesar Chavez, but I didn't know that about Larry Itliong and the Filipino farm workers who helped start the grape grower strike. And they partner with Cesar Chavez to take their strike nationally. And last, but certainly not least, I didn't know about Wong Kim Ark, who was a civil rights pioneer. Wong Kim Ark was born in San Francisco in 1873 to Chinese immigrants. And he grew up in a time period where hatred towards Chinese Americans was at its zenith. He traveled to China and tried to come back. And he was told that he wasn't a US citizen. Wong Kim Ark fought all the way to the Supreme Court and in its landmark ruling, it ruled that if you are born in this country, you are a citizen of this country. I am a citizen of this country and standing before you today because of the bravery and sacrifice of Wong Kim Ark. So what can you do? We have educators here on the webinar and those of you that are watching from home. And I have three asks of you as my fellow educators. Number one, is to increase the visibility of Asian Americans in your classroom curriculum. And to start in small steps, just one thing that you can do. You know, a lot of my colleagues who I talk to say, well, you know, where can I find this curriculum? And, and you know, increasingly in the last few years, there have been a lot more content put out by publishers, by nonprofit groups. This is just one, it is not, um, you know, representative of all groups, but it is a good place to start. It's the Asian American EDU project. And it has not only professional development, but it has lesson plans by grade level. I started in integrating and um, using Asian American writers throughout both of the classes that I teach, but especially in the AP English class. And um, I found that these discussions are some of the richest discussions that I've had. And growing up from a school system where um, I really kind of accepted invisibility to openly talking about Asian American identity with my students has been uh, really illuminating and revealing for me. And I know some of you that are on the call saying, well, I don't really, this is, doesn't really connect with my content area. The one thing that I do know about teachers is that we are masterful at finding our own path of integrating new resources and new ideas into our curriculum. The second ask of you is, might may seem a little bit unusual, but it's to add an Asian American to your social media feed. And I think the reason why this is important is that it really normalizes an Asian face as part of your everyday life because so one of the first things that most of us do in the morning is we check our social feeds. So a few um, possibilities to maybe add. Um, Lisa Ling is a really groundbreaking journalist who does incredible work in all kinds of topics. Um, one that I truly love is Amanda Pingbody Bakaya. Um, her Instagram handle is a long last name. She has been doing just really groundbreaking artwork related around AAPI visibility and anti-Asian um, bias work. Ali Wong is a hilarious comedian. You know, she has a lot of like funny, funny takes and she's also one that I think is, is fun to follow too. Okay, my third ask of you is to watch some amazing Asian media content. And I really wish that Hollywood was producing just incredibly nuanced, thoughtful Asian American perspectives. But unfortunately, Hollywood is a little bit behind in terms of a lot of the Asian um, studios that are producing just incredible content. And I think one of the things that I think um, movies and TV shows, they do really well, they normalize human struggles um, through art. So a few ideas, obviously Squid Game was an incredibly uh, groundbreaking series. It's the number one most watched Netflix series ever. Um, sorry to those of you that are Bridgerton fans. And two other examples, like, you know, Netflix actually has a lot of Asian content on it. Ite One Class, Mr. Sunshine, I think are two good examples. And I'm really into food and restaurants. Chef David Chang runs um, a really interesting series called Ugly Delicious, where he travels 
and he eats delicious things, but he also talks about the cultural context of food as well. So my three asks are increase the visibility of Asian Americans in your classroom curriculum, add an Asian American to your social media feed, and just watch some amazing Asian media content. One of the things that I've learned about teaching and one of the things I love about teaching is that it is about progress. It is not about perfection. I am by no means a perfect person, but one of the things I strive for each and every year is just to improve my practice. And a lot of that really comes from listening to my students and using my students' experiences and their voice to really guide my development as a professional. And my students have been my greatest teachers. And one, one of the things that they've taught me is that it's important to step out of your comfort zone, to understand that talking about things that um, you might be uncomfortable with, for example, I was really uncomfortable talking about my own identity, can oftentimes lead to the uh, greatest growth as a person. I want to end with this quote from Atticus. And Part of the reason why he's such a beloved character in American literature is his focus on empathy. And if you can see someone, if someone is visible to you, then there's a chance that they can be three-dimensional. And if someone is three-dimensional to you, then they can be fully human. And if someone's fully human, then they don't ever have to go back to where they came from because they are already home. Thank you, everybody. Um, that is my presentation here. If you have questions or comments, just put it in the chat. I am happy to answer that for you. I'm also going to put my email address here in case you need to contact me or you want to reach me. And now I'll transfer it over to our next host. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Cabby. That is so inspiring and uh, bringing the humanity of what otherwise would be stereotypes is what our jobs are to do. And in, in that spirit, we wanted our next section to be uh, for some of our um, coalition members to talk about their heroes. And we asked them to share at least one of their heroes who are APIDA or a API. And to and those that hero need not be famous. It need not be historical. Could be someone who's currently living, but is someone that they admire for their courage, outstanding achievements, or noble qualities. And so I'd like to present first of all the next person, which will be Angela Jenkins. So next slide. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Lorna, and thank you all for being here with us today. Uh, my name is Angela Jenkins. My Chinese name is Taisia, and I identify as Malaysian Chinese American. My heroes are my late maternal grandmother, or in Chinese, Popo, Lei Yokling, and my parents, Gwen and Frank Fu. You see, despite the challenges thrown at them, they have always been able to rise up. Growing up, my papa would share stories of my family's forced immigration path, where they left southern China during the Japanese invasion. As the eldest child, Popo shared through her experience the story of their long journey south on foot, with 10 children in tow, with just the very bare necessities that ultimately led them to Malaysia, a small Southeast Asian country located between Thailand and Singapore, where they settled. Interestingly, many years later, my own parents embarked on a similar journey, though not due to war, but in search for greater opportunities after struggling many years to provide for my sister and I and immigrated to the United States. I was 12 and my sister was six at the time. With no other family members or friends in the US, they worked hard to build stability for us. And that included creating a community just for our family. My dad spoke very little English, though somehow he managed to master it conversationally. 
and the language barrier was never an impediment for my dad. Collectively, my parents worked very long hours, ungodly long hours, in the grind in search of the American dreams. They instilled in my sister and I that education is one of the paths to secure financial wealth that they worked so hard for so many years to achieve. The other word that I chose to describe my, my heroes is progressive. And I chose the word because during a time when it was a taboo, my papa left a relationship, uh, though the details are unknown to me or the family, with two young boys in tow and remarried sometime later to my late grandfather, Gong Gong, and together they started a new family. She was a feminist of her time, a staunch supporter of independence, breaking the cultural norms where women are homemakers and depend on their husbands for support. She was a strong advocate for love when it comes to the matter of the heart where for her, no one or state should interfere. With her as the matriarch of our family, interracial marriage is not only accepted, but embraced. I am a strong believer that I am the embodiment of these amazing folks in my life where I am the person that I am today because of them. Immigration runs very deep in my family's history, and um, I can't wait to see where the future will lead us. And thank you so much for having me share a few bits of my family's history and my personal heroes with you today. Thank you so much, Angela, that was amazing. And now I'd like to introduce Ron Kuramoto. Hello. Uh, my name is Ron Kuramoto, and I'm both the executive director of the Peace Learning Center of Milwaukee and president of the Japanese American Citizens League Wisconsin chapter. And my APIDA hero is the late Norman Mineta, who recently passed away on May 3rd, 2022, at the age of 90. Um, Norman Yoshio Mineta was born in San Jose, California on November 12th, 1931 the youngest of five children. His father immigrated to the United States as a teenager in 1902, and his mother, a picture bride, arrived 10 years later. The couple denied citizenship under the Immigration Act of 1924, also known as the Asian Exclusion Act, settled in San Jose, California, ran a successful insurance agency, and raised their five children, all American citizens by birth. Norman had just turned 10 when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. He said it was the first time he saw his father cry. He saw him cry five months later when the Mineta family was ordered to a racetrack stable, then to a makeshift concentration camp in Northern Wyoming called Heart Mountain, where they lived in a barracks compound enclosed by barbed wire and patrolled by armed guards. And we will talk a little bit about that later. But Norman Mineta um, was at Heart Mountain for over 18 months, then returned back to San Jose, California, where he graduated high school, attended and graduated University of California, Berkeley, graduated in business, was a military intelligence officer for three years, and then came back to San Jose, California to work in his family's insurance business. Norman Mineta got into local politics when he ran for San Jose City Council seat and then became the first Asian American elected mayor of a major US city, uh, city in 1971. He was then elected to Congress in 1974 and served for 20 years from 1975 to 1995. Um, in his um, career in Congress, um, four decades after Norm Mineta's childhood scaring, scarring experiences in an American government run incarceration camp, the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, which he co-sponsored, was signed into law by President Ronald Reagan. It authorized $20,000 payments and official apologies to the survivors and heirs of 120,000 Americans of Japanese ancestry who had been incarcerated as potential saboteurs or spies after Japan's surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, 1941. 
Many victims could not be found, but $1.6 billion in reparations were eventually paid to 82,200 people. Um, you'll notice on the slide that he also became the first Asian American cabinet official, and he served in both Democratic and Republican administrations. This occurred when he became Secretary of Commerce in the year 2000 under President Bill Clinton's Democratic administration. He then became Secretary of Transportation and the only Democrat in an otherwise all Republican cabinet of President George W. Bush in serving from 2001 to 2006. He was Secretary of Transportation on September 11, 2001, when he personally had to ground over 4,500 aircraft in US airspace um, almost instantaneously, and he did so safely, and eventually created the Transportation Security Administration. He also fought the Muslim ban that was going around and also racial violence targeting Muslims and others appearing to be Muslims or of Arab descent. Um, he also helped to co-sponsor the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, during his career. So he was a proponent of equal treatment and civil liberties for all, and that was regardless of citizenship status. But I think one of the things that isn't well known about my AAPI uh, hero is that he also was a lifelong advocate and educator. You'll note there that there's a website listed, which is www.whatdoesitmeantobeanamerican.com. In that, there, this is a set of curriculums that have been put together combining both video and other things for um, high school and college age students that's clustered under six different curriculum topics. One, immigration. Two, civic engagement. Three, leadership. Four, civil liberties and equality. Five, justice and reconciliation. And six, Japan-America relations. That's all fine. Uh, Normanetta is also somebody who I had personally met and known, and that's what I remember him the most for. So I'd like to conclude with um, um, more or less a story that I know from him. Um, in 1941, excuse me, in 1942, a 10-year-old Norm was wearing his Cub Scout uniform and clutching a baseball mitt and bat when he and his siblings boarded a train in San Jose, California, bound for an unknown place in an uncertain future. He recalled a U.S. soldier confiscating the bat, calling it a deadly weapon. The Mineta family eventually were taken to Heart Mountain, Wyoming, to a makeshift settlement surrounded by a tall barbed wire fence. He relates, my family was told by the military authorities that internment was for our own protection, but the machine guns and searchlights in the guard towers surrounding Heart Mountain faced inward. Simply put, we were incarcerated solely because of our ethnic background. We lost our homes, we lost our businesses, we lost our farms, but worst of all, we lost our most basic human rights. Our own government had branded us with unwarranted stigma of disloyalty, which clings to us all still to this day. Decades later, when Norm Mineta was serving in Congress, a Los Angeles man sent him a token gift for what he had lost as a boy. It was a bat that had belonged to Hall of Famer Hank Aaron. It was worth $1,500, more than the $250 a House member could accept according to federal rules. And Norm had to return the bat to its sender. Quote, the damn government's taking my bat again, he said at that time. I last ran into Norm Mineta four years ago over lunch, and I noticed that he had a cane fashioned out of a baseball bat. When I asked him about this unusual walking stick, he smiled and told me, this way I'll always have my bat with me. In baseball, there's an old saying that you practice and prepare and wait your turn. And when it's your turn to bat, you get up and you take your very best swings and then sit down and give the next person their turn. In his 90 years of life, hardship, resilience, and public service, my AAPI hero, Norman Mineta, certainly waited his turn. And when his opportunities came up, took his best swings. And we are all better for it. You done good, Norm. You done real good. Thank you. That's an amazing story. And what a life from being 
10 when he had to go into the Japanese incarceration uh, camp to the accomplishments that he had. Thank you, Ron. And next we'll have Macy Her. Thank you, Lorna. So my name is Macy Her. My Hmong, the pronoun, Hmong, the pronoun, should I say Hmong pronunciation of my name is Macy. And, and uh, I am Hmong American. Um, I am the CEO um, of the Hmong Wisconsin Chamber of Commerce. And um, I really thought about who I um, should present on as my hero. And I decided to choose someone. While there are many heroes I do have, um, I decided to choose my father, who is one of my biggest heroes. And this photo that you see here is of me sitting on my father's lap um, as a child here in the United States. And uh, my father, you know, when he came to the United States in, 19, in the fall of 1976, and my, uh, my father was 20 something years old, and he decided that he wanted to um, go to uh, high school. At the, um, he wanted to graduate from high school. He wanted to make sure that his children saw him achieving um, a level of formal education in the United States. And so he did that. Um, uh, but I should also mention that when he came to the United States, he not only brought me, I was the only child he brought over. Um, I was the, I'm the eldest of six. Um, and he brought with him his, my, my mom, his uh, parents, his mom and dad, um, his two siblings, a brother and a sister, as well as uh, two nephews. So we all came to the United States and we ended up being, um, uh, being, uh, sponsored by a church in Ashtabula, Ohio. I don't know how many of us here know where that is, but that's Ashtabula, Ohio. So we ended up there. My father um, was the first in our family to graduate from high school in the United States. He went to the local high school as a non-traditional student, meaning not the traditional age of, you know, um, a, 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 someone who is at most 18 years old, 17 years old. Um, but at that time, you could do that. So he did that. And I remember, I have vague memories of him graduating wearing his high school gown. He was also an entrepreneur. And um, he, I love talking about his story because it wasn't even until recently that I started realizing my father hustled just like um, many of the, the folks I get to work with today. And he was just my dad. And um, despite the cultural language barriers that he experienced growing up, I mean, should I say in the communities in which he lived, um, he experienced discrimination by traditional banks who wouldn't give him lending dollars um, to start his businesses and so forth. He still, um, he still persisted and he was able to uh, pursue his dream of what it meant to live in the United States. He was also a very influential leader in not only his family, um, but throughout the community. And that was something I really appreciate about him. And I observed him um, very closely. You know, he led uh, many efforts that, um, that really brought about equity and um, understanding in central Wisconsin, um, in the mainstream community. And um, as a result of that, you know, I, I would like to think I tried to follow as much as I could in his footsteps and um, just working for the community, being a servant leader. And that to me um, made him a hero to me. I should also mention that one of my um, cousins who my father brought over is the first Hmong police officer in the United States. And um, he was that in Akron, Ohio. And um, he also came over to Wausau, Wisconsin, uh, tried to move with us to Wausau, Wisconsin, uh, where he was an elected official. His name is Ya Yang, for those of us who uh, may not be familiar with him, but uh, he served several different um, positions, elected positions. Um, in the Wasatch area. So uh, for those various reasons, um, my father has always been a hero to me and continues to be. Thank you so much. That was great. Thank you, Macy, for sharing that. And now I'm pleased to present Hardeep Kaleka. So Hardeep, if you can turn on your um, camera and your voice. Thank you so much, Lorna. Um, and thank you, everyone. Uh, I, um, 
Party Sinclica, the executive director of the Interfaith Conference of Greater Milwaukee. Uh, my uh, family arrived here uh, in Wisconsin uh, when I was about six years old. Um, so very much a um, first generation immigrant. And um, this program has just been wonderful because I mean, for so many reasons, but I feel like we're making history as, as we kind of go through uh, some of these programs. And so many of my heroes are honestly on this, uh, this broadcast with us. Um, the person that I uh, chose as my Apita hero, uh, however, is a little bit of an ancestor. Um, so he's a, he came here. He's one of the first um, wave of uh, sick Americans um, who came over um, at that time. Uh, Bugget Singh Tind, and Bugget Singh Tind was, like myself, uh, a native of Punjab, India. Uh, he immigrated to America in 1913, uh, working in an Oregon lumber mill. He paid his way through uh, the University of California, Berkeley, and enlisted in the U.S. Army in 1917. Uh, at that time, uh, the United States was in World War I, uh, where he, um, he fought for the US. And he was one of the first, if not the first, that's up to kind of history, uh, as first turban wearing Sikh in the US military. Uh, in 1920, he applied, uh, following his time in the military, he applied for citizenship and was initially approved by the US District Court. However, when the Bureau of Naturalization uh, appealed, this case made its way to the Supreme Court. And uh, Bhagat Singh's attorney expected a favorable decision uh, since the year before uh, the ruling came out that declared Caucasians eligible for citizenship and tinned as most uh, North Indians at that time uh, were considered Caucasian. However, now the Supreme Court found it necessary to qualify the term uh, Caucasian as being synonymous with the common understanding of being white. Um, because of this tin decision, many other East Indians who were already naturalized and had their citizenship, um, those, that citizenship was rescinded. Uh, the TIN decision also meant that um, those that um, had land uh, and were Indian immigrants um, or purchased or leased their land would also end up losing their land and uh, would not be landowners because of that, because they didn't fit the common understanding of being white. Uh, TIN would petition for naturalization a third time in 1935, uh, after Congress passed um, the, Nile, the Nile Act, which made World War I veterans eligible, uh, all World War I veterans eligible for naturalization, regardless of their race. So based on the status of, as a veteran uh, of the United States military during World War I, he was finally granted uh, full citizenship nearly two decades after he first petitioned for naturalization. Um, and over time, and as many, uh, many, many have already alluded to as public pressure uh, for Asian Indians grew throughout World War II and their service to the US military, President Truman uh, on July, uh, July 2nd, 1946, signed into law the, the Lucy Seller Act. This act reversed the TIN decision from before by explicitly is extending racial eligibility for naturalizations to natives of India and set um, a token quota for immigration uh, at 100 people per year. TIN himself, um, Bhagat Singh would go on to earning his PhD. Uh, he would become a published author. He would fight for uh, Indian independence from uh, the British, although usually the person that we hear about that fought the entire British colonial system was uh, Gandhi. Um, there was a lot of people who who kind of helped with that. Um, 
and he would go on to become a professor and a respected theologian uh, who incorporated his teachings of Sikhi with other faith traditions, often speaking on um, Jesus and, and other faith traditions from the perspective of him um, and his understanding of his experience as, as a Sikh. Um, and I think one of the things that, you know, as we were, as we were um, discussing, uh, one of the things that came up and thinking about his journey was how, how much he just needed to earn his citizenship, how much he needed to be, um, you know, and how, how much he was treated as that forever foreigner, despite him being a World War I vet, fighting for the, you know, and, and earning his PhD, um, you know, just being, being a, good, a good man. And I think about how much our existence um, has to be so qualified and that we have to go above and beyond so much to be, to be treated or to be, to be understood to be a hero or to be a person. So thank you so much. Thank you, Pardeep. As you can see from our speakers, everyone has named someone who's had a deep impact on them personally, either through their own family or through someone who has been inspirational historically. And I thank you all for sharing your very heartfelt stories. That is really, really wonderful. And so now I'll turn the baton back to Michael on behalf of the PBS Wisconsin team. Thank you, Lorna. Thank you, all of our speakers. Uh, this has been so rich, so elucidating. Um, wrapping up here, our first bullet point, I think feels very apropos. Keep learning and sharing knowledge. Check out more resources on stopping Asian hate and building background knowledge around the APITA community, both nationally and here in Wisconsin. Um, you've got some great recommendations from uh, Wisconsin Teacher of the Year, Cabby Hong, uh, if you registered for this webinar, we're going to be emailing you some resources you can follow up with, but you can also check back uh, on the um, PBS website to watch this webinar as a recording and in the details uh, of that YouTube channel, you'll be able to see those resources. Everything's linked there for you as well. So please keep learning. Uh, this might just be the start for some of us. Um, and I hope you feel empowered and excited to know more because this is such uh, an important topic. Um, secondly, take action, right? You've, you've taken the first step. If you're here, if you're learning, if you're listening, uh, take action. Connect with the AAPI Coalition of Wisconsin directly. You can see their email addresses here, uh, and we'll drop that in the chat for you as well. You can also follow their Facebook page to find out about upcoming events and different ways to advocate. Uh, number three, turn that WASB resolution into educational policy. Uh, resolution is, is a nice enough word, but policy, that's the word with teeth. So let's turn that resolution into policy. Talk to your school board members, talk to your elected officials about ensuring that a PETA-based curriculum has a permanent home in Wisconsin schools. Uh, and hopefully there will be a ripple effect too, and this will be a, a national policy um, as well. Uh, we are just about out of time, but I'm going to check the chat just in case there are any hot burning questions uh, that we might be able to ask before we sign off. Uh, looks like there is a whole lot of gratitude. I love seeing that. That is much deserved. Um, oh, thank you, uh, just in the chat. Uh, make sure to check out the AKA teacher post that's featuring Cabby Hong, um, along with some of those resources that we mentioned earlier. Um, I see a lot of love. I see a lot of uh, much earned gratitude, respect, uh, but I don't see any burning questions, which is perhaps just as well, because it is nearly 530 when we uh, figured we were going to end anyway. Um, on behalf of PBS Wisconsin Education, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you especially to the AAPI Coalition of Wisconsin and Cabby Hong for taking so much time and energy and love to be here to talk, uh, to share, uh, to get personal. Um, I, I, I hope that uh, people who are able to tune in today tell their friends, tell their family members to come back and, and watch this, share this, get the word out there. Um, you have a lot of ways that you can follow up. 
I'm going to give you two more before we officially close out. Uh, if you want to check out some more resources uh, from PBS Wisconsin Education, feel free to uh, connect with us. You can sign up for a newsletter. Uh, the uh, web address is right there, pbswisconsineducation.org backslash connect hashtag newsletter. Follow us on Facebook, uh, and you can follow us on Twitter as well. Uh, that's all we have for you today, and I hope that that was more than enough. Thank you again so, so much to everyone who tuned in, to everyone who registered to be here, to the AAPI Coalition of Wisconsin, to Cabby Hong, and to everyone who made this possible. Uh, as I said, a lot of time, a lot of energy, and a lot of love went into this. I hope you enjoyed uh, watching it and learning from it as much as we enjoyed putting it on for you. Thanks a lot, folks. Be safe. Be good to each other. Take care. Bye-bye.